Hi, and welcome to the Psych Health and Safety Podcast. My name is Jason Van Shee, and I'm one of the hosts of the show. The aim of the podcast is to rapidly increase the knowledge and application of psychological health and safety in workplaces worldwide. To help with this, we have regular guests from around the world who are leading the way in this important area. But before I introduce our guest and topic for today, allow me to introduce my co-host, Joelle Mitchell. How are you today, Joelle? Oh, you know, dealing with insurance companies, it's um, a, a joyful a joyful thing to be doing. Um, yeah, not stressful at all. Yeah, and not just one, but multiple two, insurance yeah, companies. Yeah, two, two claims for the same incident. So, yeah, it's um, coming to the end of a very long three-month process, thankfully, but um, I'll, I'll think I'll be glad when this week is, is over and done with. And you'll be back in your house next back week. Back in my house, yes, after living in a hotel for three months. It's not as fun as it sounds, people. Yeah. <laughs> so you, you were doing hotel quarantine, I guess, before it was cool. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and much longer than maybe 14 in, days. Well, maybe, maybe before it was cool in Perth, but um, probably not elsewhere. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, all right. So, yeah, glad, glad to hear that you'll be getting home soon, Joelle. I think it's going to be very good for your mental health. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> all right. I'd like to now introduce our guest for today. He's a Brit now working out of Hong Kong um, and has founded or been involved in several interesting enterprises, including the ironic manager and organizational misbehaviorists. In his downtime, he's co-host of Drinking Dialogues, uh, but in his day job, he's chief cognitive officer at EQ Labs. Welcome to the podcast, Dr. Richard Clayton. Oh, thank you for having me, Jason and Joel. Uh, as I was saying off air, um, you came uh, with a, uh, again, uh, a, a, a lot of people or a, a couple of very influential people, I should say, who are saying that you're the person to talk to around impression management. So I'm really glad that we could have someone of your caliber on the podcast so early in, in our episodes. I'll, I'll do my best to, to, to live up to that uh, description and that recommendation, Jason. <laughs> Uh, we do like to like put the pressure on our, our guests and like get the bar really high. So um, okay, okay, and, and no, I'll, one, I'll... no one has failed us so far, Richard. So. You, you can let me know. You can let me know what you think at the end. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we will. <laughs> All right, Richard. Um, before we get into talking about serious stuff, um, we'd like to ask you: What are you listening to at the moment? What are your favourite podcasts? Um, so the two, the two that I most regularly listen to um, is uh, Eat, Sleep, Work, Repeat by Bruce Daisley, who in the UK, um, which is really talking about the, the contemporary science and evidence-based practice of, of organisational life and et cetera. And then one by uh, Simon Weston called Edgy Ideas, which is more leadership focused. And they're both trying to push um, new ways of thinking into, into the wider management and organisational sphere. And then we have our own, which is called Candid Crack, uh, and we call it crack in the Irish spelling, uh, meaning so it's a vulnerable point, um, an enjoyable social activity, a conversation and, and a, as, as an attempt to have a crack at something. So to try and achieve something. And, and we're doing similar sort of things in those two podcasts talking about organisational behaviour and, and leadership and management and, and, and where we might go in the future. All right, and um, tell us a bit about drinking dialogues because it's not um, it, it's not a podcast and it's not a webinar. It's um, you, it's something a little bit different. So, can you explain to our listeners what drinking dialogues is? Well, it's 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 a, it's dialogical learning. So it's learning through through the art of dialogue. Um, it, it's difficult to describe. What I'll try and what I'll try and do is, is, is what we're trying to recreate. So we're trying to recreate the kind of conversations that you have in liminal or in between spaces at work. So the the the, the, the discussion you'll have with a colleague over a coffee break or an after work drink or over lunch, etc., in which you build a, a trusting relationship together. You learn to understand each other in, in, in different ways, but you also start talking about work in a in a meaningful manner where it's not formalized. And out of those conversations insights come so there's i think there's quite a there's research that suggests in these informal conversations about 90 percent of innovative practice comes out of informal or semi-formal conversation so given given the lockdowns around the world we tried to recreate spaces virtually where that could happen um and it, it's it's sort of taken a life of its own and we're being dragged into, into spaces that we, we never expected to be dragged into as more and more people sort of offer, offer ideas and, and things to talk about. Interesting um, that you, you make that point about sort of um, how innovation starts because both Peter Kelly and Marianne Baton have um, 
commented that the starts of their um, or the beginnings of their national standards for um, psychological health and safety in the workplace were um, happened in the pub. Uh, all the all the best things happen in these liminal spaces because you 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 are no longer restricted, and and, and a lot of what we talk about with impression management, but you're no longer restricted by the formal expectations of the role. There's there's a softening of the role where where you can have the kind of conversations that maybe in the workplace you'll be branded as a troublemaker, but in the pub or over a nice cup of coffee, you're not you don't have that judgment. And, and so it can extend into spaces that, that perhaps wouldn't be available in, in the more formal environment. You can be outrageous and it might just lead somewhere. Absolutely, yes. Great. Well, can you tell us about your professional career to date? It looks very interesting from, from what I've seen of it and I'd love to hear a bit more about it. Um, yeah, so, so Kierkegaard said you, you have to live your life forwards, but you'd only make sense of it backwards. And that pretty much describes my career. I mean, I, I've never planned to go where I've, arrived as it were um it, it it's a lot of it's been accidental in terms of doing educational qualifications that led to another one that led to another one without planning it um, but in, in in real terms i started off as an artist so i trained as a fine artist and, and i was an artist in residence for a while i then realized that i was going to die a pauper if i carried on doing that so so i trained to be a uh, an English language instructor and went off and traveled for a bit and taught English. Mm -hmm. um, I then met a girl who took me to Denmark and I set up my own business in Denmark, teaching a much more professional communication. So mm -hmm. negotiation skills, presentation skills, professional writing, etc. Mm -hmm. Got a little bit embarrassed that I only had a fine art degree and was teaching you know, IBM executives how to do all of this. Um, went and took a master's in cross-cultural communication and international management, of which the cross-cultural communication I'd worked on for years, so I knew inside out, but I fell in love with the international management, which led to a PhD on organisational irony um, and, and the, the role of irony in, in long-term organisational transformations. And then a bit of time back in corporate uh, and, and after that, in and out of various university roles and the startup kind of work that you've already mentioned with, with the various different companies. That, that's a fascinating pathway. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, we do like to hear about the, the backgrounds of, of different guests. And I think especially for our um, sort of early career or student listeners, um, it's really interesting, especially to hear about those um, unusual pathways into this area of work because it really does illustrate that you know there's no one correct way to to get into it and um yeah th there's lots of different approaches that you can take um you have had a lot of interesting titles um in the past including chief executive misbehaviorist which i thought was one of my favorites that i saw on your profile but um at the moment you're the chief cognitive officer at eq lab so tell Ooh. us what does that involve um, so EQ Lab does two things. So one um, is is the dialogic learning, that the, the, the drinking dialogue. So we, we look at how do you learn through dialogue and how do you innovate through dialogue in this sort of more liminal, unstructured way. Uh, and the second thing we do is we we sort of try and collect interesting people and interesting ideas through those through those dialogues, and we turn that into a model of future work. Um, so which, which again I'll. I'll, I'll sort of move in and out of as we go through this this podcast but we so we create this model of future work and and plug people in who can do um interesting interventions ac across all the various different levels so my my job is really to, to to sort of find these people to plug their work into the the model and to, to keep a level of coherence in it so that you know, we, we're always talking about the same thing and we're always, we, we understand um, how everything interrelates, et cetera, et cetera. So, so that's the cognitive element. It, it's sort of holding it all together in a sort of transdisciplinary synthetic way, um, which is sort of where my nice transdisciplinary background comes from. You know, I, I can do that because I've had so many other paths into the work that I'm doing. So it's, it's, it's that cognitive coherence of, of the model that we can then try and, and, and do interventions from. Okay, and can you tell us a little bit about what the model looks like? <laughs> yeah, so we have, we have five different um, levels of work that we think are involved in, in future work, um, uh, of which uh, 
a really successful organization has to be good at at least the, the four of them and might have occasional visits to the fifth. So, so the bottom one, um, which is sort of the roots of the organization, is the stuff that, that you guys talk about well-being. I mean, it, it, if you don't actually create well-being, as a, you don't understand the role of well-being within your, your organization, it rots at the roots because nobody has the cognitive capacity to do the work and, and they're suffering from fade out and burnout and all of these kind of things. Um, the, the level above that, we're really looking at impression management. So that's what we're going to be talking about then and, and the behaviors around impression management, which can suck you into poor well-being. Above that, we're looking at what are the behaviors of uh, the most productive behaviors in organizations. How do you structure organizations to, to create productive advantages? Above that, still we're going into performance and we separate performance from productivity quite distinctly, whereas productivity is just time and error rate and, and, and performance is these interpersonal relationships where where people come together collectively and, and, and solve problems in, in a again a dialogical kind of manner and then right at the top we, we sort of have inspiration and originality which is where all of this comes together and you've got moments where you can take the organization into places that you weren't ever expecting it could be taken because you're opening up possibilities to, to do work that you didn't imagine existed previously so we go right from from the, the roots of well-being to the top branches of, of, of future possibility and, and, and try and intervene and, and help organisations at every level in between. So, so, Richard, it sounds like what you're actually saying is that psychological health and safety really forms the foundation of any organisation that would like to ultimately innovate. Absolutely, yes. <laughs> I guess you said that before. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, the roots of everything is, is for me is well-being. You put well-being uh, instead of looking at, the, uh, at sort of the economics of everything and, and then putting economics at the centre. You put well-being at the centre, and if you create well-being, then out of it comes the kind of work that contemporary organisations need to have done. Um, it's oblique. It's not necessarily easily measurable or seeable the way that economics are, but it will create something way better than that that hard target-based economic share or the value perspective does. Yeah, um, I mean, we're already seeing that internationally, right? You see um, countries like Bhutan um, who have put gross national happiness above gross domestic product. So, um, yeah, maybe they've been listening to you. <laughs> I'm not sure I quite have. My influence quite stretches that far. But I, I think I, I think personally that the evidence is, is very strong and has been, you know, people have been writing about this for 20, 30 years, um, it's just not mainstream. Uh, and it, it, as a part of our role is, well, can we, can we nudge this kind of thinking into, into a bit more of a mainstream space? Yeah, absolutely. And that's obviously one of the goals of, of the podcast. Yeah. So um, let, let's move on to the topic then. Um, obviously, we're here to talk about impression management today. Mm -hmm. So um, what got you interested in impression management to start with? Um, so really really the PhD. Um, so so I, I said earlier on, I was talking about irony, but we also talked about ambivalence uh, and I didn't publish any chapters about ambivalence, but ambivalence, um, first of all, it's, it's, worth, it's worth defining what it is because people confuse it with indifference and it's different. <laughs> so ambi means both and valence is strength. So, so it's having two emotional or cognitive pull, pulls in different directions and equally strong. So the uh, emotional ambivalence is, is the experience of deeply loving and deeply hating your job at the same time. Um, cognitive ambivalence would be deeply supporting and deeply rejecting uh, an idea at the same time because you know it's, it's, it, you want to keep on doing it, but it's harmful for you, so et cetera, et cetera. So we looked at, we looked at the, um, at sort of the, the, when, when organisations were, were transforming so you actually had this, this vision of the future, this aspirational vision of the future, where we're going to. Uh, and people sort of, people really respected the vision. Um, they, they, they thought, this is really good. This is aspirational. I, I really want to get there. Perhaps they also loved the job that, you know, that they, they had the education and experience and the work that they were doing. And, and so they had this, this deep love for the company and the vision and the job they were doing. Mm. But then the process of transformation and change and, and, and the stuff that they had to do was causing all of this sort of messiness and complexity and uncertainty. And that was that the, they were coming into that with a, a sort of a deep hatred of the job that they used to love. Or perhaps uh, someone was becoming toxic because they couldn't deal with it. And then and that was creating 
uh, sort of this hatred and, and within the team. And it was it, we were looking at how do people deal with that, and and we looked at emotional responses, which was. Um, you know, it was basically yeah breakdown. It was it, it was an inability to cope, uh, spiraling into fade out and burnout and uh, potential personality disorders, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, as you crashed, um, we looked at cognitive dissonance. So so how do you rationalise the the fact that you 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 can't be pulled apart and you've got to have one specific way of performing, and, and then we looked at irony, which was this um, ability to to find it absurd rather than um, the ability to the, rather than get pulled apart by it and, and, and just start playing around and lightly with it uh, and that took us uh, that, that takes us all the way into into impression management which is well if you if you've got two audiences one of which takes everything seriously and one of which doesn't how do you perform to both audiences simultaneously without being pulled apart Mm. Uh, and that's what I'm really interested in within impression management. But but most impression management doesn't go that way. Most impression management is around performing to the expectations of the the good part of the organisation, the part everyone expects you to do, which can continue to tear you apart because you, you're you're hiding all of your emotions and you're, you're you're separating them from the actual performance, and that that's deeply problematic to the psyche. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I remember studying cognitive dissonance and seen it in action many times myself, <laughs> how people can be pulled apart when their values and, and behaviours are, you know, very, very different. Um, also interesting that you talk about the, uh, the difference between ambivalence and indifference. Um, I'm sure we had our own drinking dialogue one Friday afternoon at work about the, the difference between the two. Um, and we had to be pulled up and, and recognise that they're actually two very different uh, constructs. But um. So talk, talking about impression management, and I, I guess that's kind of a, a broader definition that you've given us there. How, how would you see impression um, management or, or lack of um, manifesting itself as a psychosocial hazard? Um, so one of the challenges that I think that we, we perhaps not so that much in Perth because you haven't been knocked down as, as much as the rest of us, but, but during... Yeah, periods of working from home, etc. The 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 challenge of impression management when you're no longer within the organisation. Okay, so you're you're separate from the decision makers. You're separate from the activity. You're you're locked at home, um, trying to display your value, trying to give the impression that you're doing the work and you're valuable via a tiny little computer window, and and that's your that that's your only window into into. Pr- proving to people that you're valuable. And so that locks us into a, a lot of problematic behaviors. So one of, one of the behaviors that certainly I've been seeing in, in, in some of the research I've been doing is the, the, um, the unending Zoom calls where you've got you know, one Zoom call after another, after another, after another, after another, with no, with no breaks between. So you're, you're not even having the, limit, the space in the liminal, the liminal space where you go from one meeting to another mm. and can take the deep breath and, oh, okay, I've got out of that one. Let's have a little bit of a walk. Let's have a cup of cooker glass of water go by the water cooler meet a friend say something and go to the other meeting you're just going click bang click bang click bang and there's no there's no other self available to you there's just this this in professional self that you have to perform all the time and you're always being watched so because the zoom window you, you're being looked at by by somebody else so that that, that performance is always being evaluated and then you don't want to be seen as not contributing to the wider organisational uh, processes outside of, of the Zoom window. Um, so you're trying to get yourself on all the email chains. You're trying to get into the, all, the, all of the wide the, the, the conferences to show that you're there. Um, and that expands work. Mm. Um, so, so you're actually doing, and, and I've, I've spoken to, to one of our drinking dialogue reg- regulars in the States, and he's talking about doing, you know, seven and a half hours, eight hours of back-to-back Zoom meetings, and then still having to do his work on top mm. of it. So, so he's, he's, the work come, comes in, in the evening afterwards. So in terms of psychological hazard, you know, all of this stuff is the impression management. You don't have 
to have meeting after meeting after meeting after meeting. You don't have to be in all the email chains. You don't have to, to, to constantly do this work. It's a display of doing the work rather than actually doing the work. It's the impression of doing work. And the knock-on is, well, there's, there's a double knock-on. Um, so one is a you end up working ridiculously long hours, which the organization then calls productivity, which is a problem in itself. But, you know, I'm, I'm now doing a 16 hour day and blah, blah, blah. And, and that you're logged on the system the whole time. And, and, and you're seen as, oh, this is great. Working from home is fantastic. Um, but you don't ever get any rest and recuperation. And of course, if you, if you, if you fail to sleep properly, if you fail to recuperate, then, then psychosocial hazards start, you know, you're, you're starting to potentially fade out and, and burn out, et cetera. Um, the other is, well, if I'm having um, only, only having small windows in which I can do the work, so I've got to look after the kids, I've got all of this blocked in meeting time, I've got to have the relationship with my wife, I've got to do other stuff. You, you push the work into tiny, intense windows. So this is the productive window where I've got 20 minutes to do something that probably should take two hours, so I'm going to work really, really quickly. Um, and so that, that work intensity that can come out of, of the, the impression management um, drive is worse for you across every psychological and physiological marker than long hours. Mm. It, 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 it will kill you. Um, not only will you make more mistakes in your work and then become more irritable and more frustrated, your, your, your physiological, the physiological side of you is going gonna, is gonna to get ill. Uh, and you're going to suffer back pain and tension and, and upset stomachs and, and all kinds of things because your that intensity is not something that you can keep up. Yeah, I mean, that's the exact definition of a psychosocial hazard, right? Anything that causes stress continuously and you're talking mm -hmm. about long, you know, sometimes as, as long as you're awake, you're at work doing stuff uh, or that intense, you know, and very, very high intensity of, of stress. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, absolutely, I can see how impression management would contribute to that. Um, when people are trying to show that they are being productive or they are there uh, when working from home. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it's, so, so that's just the work from home element. I mean, you've, you've got, you've still got impression management in the workplace. Um, I mean, you're still, and, and this is where there are some very interesting tensions to, to look at as well, because within the workplace um, you've got to display that, that, um, you're a potential leader nowadays. Everybody wants to be a leader. So you've got to display, you know, are you assertive? Are you self-confident? Do you have charisma? Are you able to influence all of these kind of things? You've got to be a good team player. Um, so, so are you positive? And, and, and um, are you, uh, are you a sort of someone that can glue the team together and all of this kind of collaborative stuff? You've then got your cultural values of the organisation that you've got to perform to. Uh, you've then got your own self-concept that you want to perform to um you know am i am i competent and, and, and am i intelligent and am i doing all of this kind of stuff and so you're, you're, you've got all of these fragmented pulls in different directions and no time because we're getting busier and busier and busier no time to reflect on any of them Mm -hmm. So you're, you're just launching from one presentation to another presentation with, again, very, very little window in between. Um, with the, the ongoing anxiety of being judged for every presentation that you do, for being judged as good enough or not good enough, or, you know, and, and this, this whole thing, you know, you need to improve this or you need to improve that. So the, the judgment is constant. Um, and it's a set, but, it, but the judgment's not consistent because the performance isn't consistent and the audience isn't consistent and mm. you need to be sensitive to, to who you're performing to and, and why you're performing to them. So even at work, you, you've, you've, I think, I think work from home and, and COVID has accentuated it and accelerated it. And, 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 you know, the fact you're having to do this while locked in your, stuck in your bedroom or your dining room. So you, you, you don't even have, you know, there's no escape from, you know, you're doing this in your house. So this whole impression management pressure, is on you but even when you go back to work it's still part of of, of the everyday um and that judgment and performance anxiety is, is constant and it does i mean for me it's the level above well-being and, and because you if you if you start to struggle it's very easy to start to slip into into distress and and um 
uh, and and the the related uh, escape attempts and, and mental health challenges related to to distress, or to be a little bit more cognitively sensible and disengage from the whole thing, yeah. which can lead to other problems. But at least you've you're creating that that space where you're disengaged from from that anxiety and and, and performance. Uh, where you can start reflecting and thinking about what you're going to do about it before the apathy and the cynicism and potentially depression sets in. So for me, that's all. Dis- disengagement is always cognitively sensible um, because the, the, the other thing when you're beginning to struggle is distress and you're, you're going into a space you don't want to go into. Yeah, and I, I think it's a very valid point that this isn't just something that's due to the pandemic and working from home. Uh, but I can definitely see the other um, side of the, the pandemic where it could be influencing people's feeling of job security, right, with the economic downturn and then the sense that they always need to be available, they always need to be performing really high because they might be the next one to lose their job. Absolutely. So the, the, the extra anxiety of, you know, when's the next downsizing coming? How, yeah. do, how do I illustrate that I'm the most valuable? Or... Um, the anxiety of having no chance of meeting your targets given the state of the world, yet not having your targets shifted. Hmm. So you know that you're going to fail. (laughs) Um, Whatever you do, you're going to fail. You've got to keep on performing as this sort of positive celebrated self you know you've got to you've got to show the the fact that you're 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 motivated and positive and and happy to continue with the grindstone even though at the, you're, you're being pulled apart by the anxiety behind you yeah and i guess some people might um have started the pandemic viewing it as a sprint right i just need to prove that i'm valuable for this downsizing but the longer the pandemic goes and the more uh, companies are starting to downsize, I guess, then, you know, it just is a continuous state of stress, right? How am I always yeah, so, doing myself? Yeah, I think, I think, I think we look at the, the way we look at it in the work we're doing is there's been three stages in the pandemic. Um, mm. So the first stage was actually the, the, uh, a really interesting learning stage because that, that, that you know, organize, you, you was, everyone suddenly had to work from home and no organization was ready. Mm. So you had that six to eight week window where well, it was a sprint, but it was a highly productive and engaged sprint because all of these people were suddenly, all of these complex problems, just solve them because we've got to keep on working. And that in itself is engaging that you, you were sort of like, right, solve this problem. And you could see the reason to solve it and the meaning and the purpose of, of, of the solution and why you were involved. And, and that was highly motivational. And I think most organisations uh, were, were surprised at the response of the employee base and how quickly they could make things happen. Um, so they, 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 you know, they found out that their employees were far more capable than, than perhaps that they, they were imagining prior. Um, so after, but after that first six to eight week window, what we've had seen is the reinjection of business as usual practices back into the work, work from home experience. Mm. So you, you know, this is where the Zoom meetings start to, you know, instead of, instead of just having one because you were the only person who knew how to use it, um, suddenly you're on Zoom meetings all day and, you're, yeah. and that impression management stuff comes in. So that's the second stage. I think we've been going through that, you know, for six, six months to a year, depending on which part of the planet that, that you're on. And then the third stage is the awareness that this is a problem and we've got to do something about it. And, and that, that is the, the thing we've got to do about it is have a deeper understanding of human behavior and specifically human behavior in relation to work, the you know, contemporary working practice. Because if we don't develop this, this deeper understanding, these second wave practices are going to cause deep mental distress in the employee base. And, and for me, it doesn't matter whether you, you're, you're altruistic or not. You know, whether even if it's just a selfish bottom line, I don't care whether I'm causing harm to my employees. Work is so complex today that if you're causing harm to your employees, they're not going to be able to do the work that, that keeps you above the competition and keeps the company going. They're, they're just going to, you know, the, the, the quality of the work you're doing is going to disappear. So whether altruistic or, or selfish, the solution is the same, which is to, again, go back to the point we, we talked at the beginning, is to put well-being at the root of the organisation and get that right, and then out of it comes the kind of work that needs to be done. Um, and part of, part of the kind of work that needs to be done is having an, a, a deep understanding of the role impression management plays and, and how it prevents work getting done, but how it also sucks people into, into sort of mental despair. Really fascinating stuff, Richard, and you um, paint a very 
bleak picture of existence for <laughs> probably a large volume of, uh, of, of the global workforce, unfortunately. Um, I'm interested in your views on um, factors or drivers that might make this situation more or less likely for people. So are there individual factors that sort of increase your propensity for this behaviour? Are there, um, you know, organisational features or, um, or structures that um, encourage this kind of um, response from people? Um, so I'll, I'll look at the work from home research first. So because that again, that's where lots of people are interested in, in this potential hybrid future uh, where we work from home and we work in organisations. So so there's you can you can look at that research in, in, in through through a number of different lenses. So the, the first one is just yeah, the the individual traits. So some some people are you know if, if you're self organised and and uh, quite disciplined and, and conscientious, you're you, you tend to be better at working from home than somebody who isn't. But I don't I don't particularly find that interesting. Uh, I'm much more in, interested in the systems rather than than the individuals. Uh, and the system. So the, the the most interesting part of the system is something that I've called the perception gap. Um, and the perception gap is, is really interesting, but also problematic. So the perception gap is the, the perception, when, once you make work from home available, so you, you get the option to work from home one day a fortnight or two days a week or whatever it is, there's a perception of the people doing that work from those staying in the organisation. Now, if there's a big perception gap, they sort of regard, the people in the organisation regard those from working from home as sort of taking a sickie or not really contributing the same amount or, you know, a bit like, oh, you know, she, she's working from home today because she needs to look after the kids so we can only expect half a day of work out of her, that, that kind of perception. Um, and if the perception gap is large, then the work from home experience results in lower productivity and lower engagement. Uh, this, is, this is pretty established, consistent research. Um, if the perception gap is small, so when the perception, you know, when, when those working from home are perceived as, a, as a, a fully visible, fully viable contributing person in the team, um, then productivity and engagement goes up because all of that autonomy and, and freedom and flexibility of the work from home experience is seen as integrated in, in, in the work. You're still doing the work, but you, you're working from home. And, and yeah, if you do need to take your child to the doctor, that's part of the work from home, but you make up for it by, by doing other things at other time. So productivity engagement goes up if the perception gap is small. So what, what happened during COVID, and again, that first six to eight week window, there was no perception gap because everybody was working from home. So you would expect to see productivity and engagement go up because there's no perception gap. Now you're beginning to see the, the, the increase of this gap again. And then this is where the business as usual um, processes get re-injected because there's a lack of trust in, in, in the home working. You've got managers who, aren't, who, are, who are fearful that, that the people aren't doing the work and they feel like they're losing control. And of course, you know, that, that, that because of the uncertainty of the world, the people are trying to, to control things more and more tightly. So you're seeing that gap reopen. And once you see that gap reopen, you see more and more visibility work or impression management going on in those working from home. And you see the expansion of hours and you see sort of some of the, some of the, the potential suffering that, that we've seen. And then, and then the final thing is almost organizational communication around uh, the, the, the challenge of, of working from home. Um, so it's, it's, it's even more than... than um, just the, the visibility work and impression management. It's how do you have the conversations that need to be had? How do you recreate to the, to the start of this, the, the liminal conversations, the, the, the conversations in, in the corridors and, and between meetings? Because I think organisations are becoming more and more aware that they're the conversations that were the lifeblood of what happened in, in the company. And, and they've all been stripped away. So how do you recreate those when, when everybody's locked into these um, uh, sort of Zoom room meets where everything's formal and recorded and watched? And how, how do you recreate this, this lifeblood of communication? Um, and how do you stop people playing with the politics of that by, by controlling it and, and, and keeping, the, keeping people out of the loops of communication and, and preventing them from having opportunities for promotion or 
uh, opportunities to get on projects, et cetera, et cetera, because there's, there's a real chance that that could happen if, if we continue, which again knocks on to the anxiety of, of not being visible and, and not being part of things and, and, and career ending possibilities of, of being locked in from home. I do, I do, I don't want to be too bleak because I do see organizations and leaders beginning to understand this beginning to, to look at levers to, to recreate this this subcultural communication and, and, and contested stuff that go that always went on behind the scenes but I think we're in the early stages of that uh, but that's what we've lost yeah so um, we're, we're very much interested in a, a systems level approach ourselves um, and that's kind of what we talk to uh, on the show um, given that there's just so much information around individual well-being and, you know, what can an individual do to make themselves more resilient or practice the self-care. Um, given some of the problems that you've outlined for employers and individuals because of impression management in this VUCA world, um, what can organisations do to adopt, I guess, more of a systems level approach to deal with some of these issues that you've just outlined? Um <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's quite tricky because no one's really trying to take impression management seriously. Um, so, so to, but but you, you're looking at some of the things that perhaps something like uh, Bridgewater did, where where they started to make everything as transparent as possible. Uh, so that, so so one of one of the wonderful stories about Bridgewater is um, the, the, the the CEO. Um, performed badly in a in a meeting uh, so it was, a, it was an investor presentation the ceo came in and, and performed badly wasn't prepared didn't do the work so the, the impression he gave off was wasn't a good one now in most organizations um that would just no one would say anything because the the power of, of the ceo doing badly is something that that nobody talks about but in bridgewater one of the first year graduate employees wrote an email to him basically saying to him that was terrible um you got a d minus at best for that performance uh, and so what he then did was um agree uh, copy the email to the entire company um, and then write a book and give TED Talks about that based on this email saying, look, this, this level of transparency where my performance, it's not, it's not just the impression. You can actually metricize it. You can actually look at it and, 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 and see, you know, graded across the entire organization and to make it meritocracy, to make, to make a meritocracy of performance rather than a politics of performance yeah. by trying to have multiple indicators within the organization um, that, 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 are, that, are, that, that sort of tell you whether that was good or was, wasn't good. So that you, and that's constant. So that, that's a constant um, evaluation from, from peers that just becomes part of everyday practice. Now, I think, I think Bridgewater is quite brutal because you've, you know, they, they do lose, I think a third of their employees in the first two years don't get through that first two years because they're 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 unused to that that level of peer evaluation, constant peer evaluation. But to be honest, it's not much different than working in academia, where everything you ever write is peer is is ripped apart by other academics. Go, that's not good enough. That's not good enough. This doesn't make sense. Blah blah blah. So so you've got that. You've got a, a long term. Um, process that does this that, that you might be able to 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 inject in organizations to to, to make it um more of a meritocracy uh, and less of a political minefield uh, and by doing that you you can start removing some of the anxiety um but it, but underneath it you've got to have again going back to the roots of well-being you've, you've got to have a, an attempt to systemize well-being so that if you if you do start slipping into into these well-being spaces, there's opportunity or, or poor well-being. There's opportunities to to to, to mend and to, to heal, rather than you suddenly get performance managed out or they they go, oh, this person's weak, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So you you've got yeah that that the fact that the pressures of impression management can lead into poor well-being is is for me the gap that that we need to be looking at. One of, one of the approaches I'm most hopeful about is salutogenesis, where you're looking at creating um, organizations that, that help people flourish rather than just interventions at the level of illness. 
um, and the sense of coherence that comes with, with that so that actually when you do the work, you've got the, the work is comprehensible to you. It's, it's manageable. So you've got access to the resources to actually do the job and it, and it creates meaning. So that, that's another way of looking at how you might be able to, to, to create a sort of meritocratic approach to performance because you, you, you've got these access to things which stops you slipping downwards. But I think the big challenge is nobody wants to have conversations about impression management because it's conversations about power and it's conversations about politics. And that's so confrontational to people. Uh, so you, you, you almost have to deflect and talk about something else in, and talk about behaviour and good behaviours and misbehaviours, which is why the, where the misbehaviourist comes from, to try and get people to recognise the, the impact uh, that, that this dramatic way of presenting self has on, on the self and on the organisation. It's very mm, rambling, so, that answer, but I hope it makes some <laughs> sense. <laughs> Yeah, uh, from what I took from that, um, you know, you're saying that, yeah, it's hard to deal with impression management at the individual level um, and the stresses that come with that at an organisational level um, that come down on the individual. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I guess if we, uh, what we're talking about is similar to demands and supports, right? If we can't get rid of the demand, which is impression management, well, let's boost support. So boosting organisational justice or transparency is a supportive environment, mm -hmm. giving people a sense of mastery or you know, um, meaningfulness in their work is another support. It's, mm -hmm. it's good work design. Um, so we can't, you know, work is, is going to be stressful and there's a lot of macro stresses that are happening in the, the world at the moment as well that are outside the control of the individual or the organisation. Mm -hmm. um, so let's look at the way we can design work to bring in some of these supports for, that we, we know are good for people's wellbeing. Yeah, so one, one of the ways we try to approach it in terms of work design is, is to say, well, um, nearly all of us now, or the work I'm doing, it, it's all complex work. So it's complex project work. It, it's, it's that kind of cognitively difficult stuff that, that people are, are struggling to do because, because of the, the uncertainty of the current situation. So what we look at doing is say, well, what, what are the components of complex work? And, and how do we create time for you to do each of these? So you're, you're making some kind of systemic yeah, yeah. So you're not really talking about impression management. You're talking about the dimensions of the role that everybody has to perform in order to do the role well. And then this within knowledge, complex project knowledge workers, that there's the same six dimensions we think. So one of them is deep work. So it's the ability to, to, to sit and focus by yourself without distraction on, on the work that needs to be done. It's what you're being paid to do. It's whatever you're designing or writing or coding, etc. cetera. Um, you've then got uh, collaborative work which is okay we're in a room together and there's a complex situation that that has to be broken down into component parts and, and we're in this room to do that uh, so how do you do that well there's connection work which is the liminal stuff i've talked about how you know the, these these meetings over coffees and, and beers where this this informal communication happens but it's highly valuable because it's where trust lies and it's where innovation lies learning work how do i learn how do i learn from others to do the job especially in onboarding but how do i also you know keep keep on top of the ongoing demands for um uh skills and digital skills and, and behavioral skills that you know that, that are constantly changing self-work so how do i how do i actually spend time on self so you know time with my family time on my hobbies time with my community time to sleep can you can you em em embrace that because without all of that none of the other makes sense and then finally sadly we have shallow work which is all the business as usual, meeting preparation, emails, admin that you need to do, which research is, is shows is about 80% of most people's week at the moment. So if you can reduce that to 20% and spend way more time doing those other five dimensions, mm -hmm. then you could you, impression management starts to slip away because you're 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 all understanding the role, the, the base roles and the base activities of the kind of work that everybody's doing. So just sending emails to each other. That shallow work, why are you doing it? Mm. Um, and so then, then you begin to move into a much more productive and, and, and performance-based way of doing the work. So perhaps you know, in terms of the level of, of building enablers and, and, and building support mechanisms, I think that is, is the kind of stuff we try to do anyway.
Yeah, I, I like that example. Um, you know, that's one of the the root causes I think for stress in, in many organisations is that shallow work, and you know that takes you away from doing what you're actually paid to do um, for your knowledge and your skills that you can bring to a job, and yet you're doing something that a um, you know, unqualified, probably 15 year old could probably do. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think I, I can remember one of the jobs I had I and mean, I was being paid a, a pretty decent consulting whack. And because they ran out of people, I spent the whole day photocopying mm. <laughs> at, at a stupid amount of money an hour, just because it had to be done. Yeah. Um, and you sort of think, well, oh, there's something wrong here with that, 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 that they're paying me all of the, you know, hundreds of dollars an hour to photocopy for them because they've just run out of heads. Yeah. Um, so that, that there's, there's, there's that kind of stuff that happens. Um, and, but what, what you really have to look at is if you can just reduce, you know, if you, if you, can, if you can increase the deep work you do, so there's the concentrated focus against world averages, if you can do four hours of that, so, you know, get up at seven and work from seven to 11 on at home when the work from home without any distractions and just do it. You're doubling the productivity um, and then you can, uh, uh, the number of productive hours that, that, that are sort of world average terms of, of this kind of work that gets done. And then you've got the whole rest of the day to do the learning stuff and the development stuff and the collaborative stuff and the connection stuff um, and some of the shallow work that gets in the way. And you're already twice as productive as, as the rest of the world. So it's, it's, it's yeah. not actually that big of a shift. It's just a, a shift in thinking that, that, that that's a possibility. Yeah, I can absolutely see how that would work. You know, you get a greater sense of accomplishment by 11 a.m. Like you say, you've done four hours of deep work or meaningful work. Get a greater sense of meaning because you're actually doing what you're good at and not this shallow work that takes up so much of our time. Um, yeah, it's a uh, yeah, very practical thing. <laughs> I'll have to try and schedule my day a little bit more like that, I think. <laughs> um, so my next question was around enablers for success um, for organisations, and it, it sort of sounds like you've really set out the, the framework there in terms of, you know, um, strategies that individuals mm -hmm. or that I guess the amount of time per day or the ratio of time that individuals should actually be spending in these different mm -hmm. types of work. Um, I suppose we, we need to get that through to, to the leaders um, mm -hmm. and, you know, the people who design the work in the organisations for that, for that approach to actually work um, unless you've got some really hard-headed employees who are just saying, no, up yours, boss, this is what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. um, so how do, we, how do we communicate that to, to the leaders who actually have that oversight of, of the way that people are um, structuring their work day? So, yeah, that, that's an interesting question, and, and it's, it's a sort of a, a, a further spoke to what we're trying to do. Um, so on one level, you, you, there, there's a classic piece of research by someone called Luthen, it's called, it's, it talks about successful, uh, successful and effective leaders or managers. And a successful leader is somebody who gets themselves promoted. So they do all of the impression management stuff. They make themselves look invaluable and they get, they get promoted up through, through the, the chain. The effective manager is someone who's incredibly good at their job, uh, and it, but doesn't necessarily get promoted. So that they, they're good, but they don't do the, the politics work. Uh, and, and you find that maybe only about 10% of, of top leaders fit in that effective category historically. Um, because people are, you know, the, the leadership is is that that you've got to do this, the, the the smooching and the smoothing and all of that kind of work to get up the ladder. Um, what's the kind of stuff we do? So I work with with somebody called Becky Andre in the states, uh, who works in in um, the complexity of thinking for for leadership development, um, and there's. Um, there's a way of measuring how whether whether the, the job they have matches the level of complexity of their thinking. So are, are they able to to understand the various different dimensions? Are they able to talk to the various different dimensions or, or not? So if you if you actually start measuring capturing and, and you can do it in people's complexity of thinking in the organization, you're going to be able to find out where your little pockets of of people who understand this complexity are and, and start giving them more responsibility. Um, the challenge is, of course, that, that this pro probably needs to come at CEO level or board level to get, because it, it's so confrontational. If you're, a, if you're a leader 
um, saying, you know, you, and, and you're given this this evaluation, and you, you it shows that your two levels of complexity of thinking below your actual role. Um, that's incredibly confrontational, um, and and so you're you're not really likely to buy this kind of evaluation because it might might show that mm. you're you're in the wrong position. So you have to align that with rapid leadership development. How do we get you up there? at pace as well. And then you have to have a, 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 a board willing to say, we need you to do this, or a CEO saying, we need to do this, because we recognize that we are part of the problem as well as the solution. And we need to be able to, if we're evaluating all of our employees, we need to apply, apply the same level of evaluation to ourselves. So there's a way of capturing the level of complexity of thinking, and there's a way of rapidly upskilling them. And of course, if you do that across the whole organization, then you've got a map of where everybody is. And if you've got a map of where everybody is, impression management goes out the window because you've got a map and you can't pretend to be a level above than you actually, than you actually are. You, you've, you've got to illustrate that you, you're at that level. It's a radical approach. I think it's, there are organizations doing it uh, and doing very well doing it, but not many. Um, and, and but that's what I would be hoping to to to, to do. And, and there there is the answer. Proper evaluation of the complexity of thinking, rapid upskilling through through high quality leadership development. And this is not the the the, the vast majority of stuff in the leadership development field. This this is going into complexity science and systems thinking and and. Um, yeah, ecosystems leadership, all of these kind of things that, that, that you, you two would both be interested in, I'm interested in, but it's not lying at the heart of most leadership development at the moment. So for a, um, a CEO who might be listening and thinking, hey, I like the sound of that, um, where would you suggest that they go for as, as a kickoff point or to start um, understanding more about this? So I'm gonna, if they're just looking to read something, um, there's a few different writers doing some interesting work out there. Um, Jennifer, Jennifer Garvey, um, Jonathan Reams, I mean, Becky Andre herself. There's a few little TED Talks and, and things, and I'm happy to send you the links as, as to, to, to what they're, they're about. Um, and and they, can, they can sort of apply to try and, if they want to, if they want to understand the process, they, they can apply to try and do the test themselves. You know, have a reach out to somebody and, and I'm happy to put them in contact with Becky and then have a go, have a, have a go at this test and, and see where you are. Um, it, it, it takes, you know, somewhere between four to six hours to do. Um, so it's, it's a day of your time, but it gives you a real uh, idea of where, of where you're positioned in, in this, this leadership model and a path. It'll give you pathways of improvement so that you're, you become more and more capable of, of a systems approach to, to organizations. Fantastic. Let's uh, throw out the challenge, Jason, to our listeners to um, do, do the test and um, let it let us know how it went. That is a fair commitment, though, four it to is. six hours. <laughs> <laughs> it is, but um, sounds like it's probably worth it. Yeah. No. Um, for for the uh, the upside that you can get, as you say, Richard, there's um, yeah probably a good use of your time. Yeah. I mean, I think if you if you want to be a leader four to six hours mm. of, of development is it, it's not a big ask um yeah. you know especially if you if you're having that feeling that you're struggling at the moment um which i think quite a lot of leaders are that, mm. that that might be a window into and again with their own perhaps mental well-being challenges that that might be a way to try and try and help them push through in, into a different way of thinking yeah absolutely so, um, Richard, it's been a fascinating conversation um, throughout this podcast. Uh, we've touched a little bit on, on, on mental health and talked about how it's kind of a pillar for, for the other four. Um, so what, what are some of your hopes for the, the future of mental health in the workplace? Uh, I, so uh, you, uh, Joelle said I've been very um, bleak throughout, but I, I, I actually I'm quite hopeful because I do see um, through, through conversations with, with various people, I do see the beginnings of an awareness that, that organizations are in, in their current state and making employees ill uh, and their mental well-being and mental health is suffering. And I do see the early stages of uh, an awareness that we need to understand human behavior more. 
uh, and and we want to do something about it. I think I think that the challenge with it is that the the available levers to people who are developing this awareness are not the correct ones. So whilst so so as the awareness opens up, there's there's going to be more and more opportunities for for, for people like you to sort of you know, get them involved in the kind of conversations to help them understand what what the dimensions are. There are digital tools that are that are around the world that are that are helping people to try and um, self manage. Um, so so before they they get into a, a state of um, sort of real psychological distress that, that, that they can self-manage and then manage their diet or their time or their sleep a little bit better, which, which, which hopefully presents, prevents the spiraling down and, and gives them opportunities to, to recenter and to refocus. Um, so I think it's, so at my most optimistic, I, I think we, we're at the beginnings of a shift from economics being the center of the organization to well-being being at the center of organization. Um, but it will take a lot of effort to, to prove to, to leaders that, that putting something that oblique, because they're going to see it as oblique in the center, is going to produce an incredible return on investment. At my bleakest, then we're just in a period of well washing where people are going to say, oh, yeah, we look after our people. And, but it, 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 it's just rhetoric and it, it, it's, it's just an attempt to, to sell stuff to, to the wider community uh, without uh, window dressing level, without really doing anything about it. I'm, I'm hoping for the former, but I think a lot of companies are still in that latter space. Yeah, they're still doing impression management, I think. Absolutely. <laughs> All right, Richard, and do you have any parting words of wisdom that you'd like to share with, uh, with professionals who'd like to work in this space of um, workplace health and safety, um, psychological health and safety, rather? Only that it's, it's going to be a field of the future. Um, now, again, we, we can frame that as it's a field where you can make a massive difference in organisations that take it seriously, both in terms of organisational performance, but in the lives and well-being of those that you work with. Or it's a way of making an easy buck without actually doing much of the work beyond the impression management or well-being. So if you're, if you're looking to do, um, to do it, make sure that you're in the former camp, that that can actually make a difference. And I've met lots of passionate people um, doing that kind of work. Uh, but sadly, an awful lot of them struggle to put their head up above the noise of those who are just selling um, not particularly good best practices. So, so keep that in mind when you're moving into it, because that's, that's the current battlefield and, and, and that's what you've got to navigate. Yeah. Lots of snake oil around in this space. Yeah, that's Joel's mentioned that a few times on the podcast. So, um, yeah, I think uh, the psych health and safety approach is often outmarketed and outsold by kind of the well-being kind of approach uh, and hopefully we can start to bring some balance to that conversation yeah i'm, I'm sure we can um, i mean I, I do think it's 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 a conversation that's going to be had more and more uh, and i do think that we're going to see a, a, the birth of, of executives who who recognize the value of it uh, we're, we're in the early stages but uh, people like you are going to make a difference so keep on doing it I, I like your optimistic view of the world, Richard. I'm going to assume that that's how it's going to end up. <laughs> <laughs> Let's hope so. <laughs> well, Richard, it's been a, a fascinating conversation. Uh, I never thought about impression management in the depth that obviously you have over the last number of years. So thank you for articulating it so well to, to the listeners today. Absolute pleasure, Jason. Yeah. So um, uh, don't forget, we uh, video all of these uh, from our, our Zoom chats. So you can watch the, the video if you're not into podcasts uh, on the uh, Flourish DX YouTube channel. Uh, Joel and I are very active on LinkedIn. I'm not sure if Richard could possibly be more active than us, but uh, I see him on there every now and again. So um, we're, we're all keen to interact and, and connect and uh, feel, feel free to follow what, what we're doing. Uh, we do, if you can't do the whole one hour uh, long podcast episodes, as they often end up being in the long format, then we do put little two to four minute snippets and we'll definitely be sharing some of the best bits from Richard. And there's going to be a few to choose from, I think. It's going to be hard to, hard to choose the, the bits that we want to put on there. Yeah. But they'll be on the flurry. DX LinkedIn page if you want to, to follow along. So thanks again, listeners, for, for tuning in and we'll catch you next episode.